A little emotional. I think Greg Pickles a little emotional right now. I'm Bob Flounders. Greg Pickles with me. This is actually our last Penn State Blitz video, but don't fret, Penn State fans. We're just doing something different during the season with our videos and our podcasts. It's going to be the blue-white breakdown, um, but the last one that's no, as, that we refer to as the Penn State Blitz uh, is going on right now. We ha we've been doing blitzes for a while, actually, so Long I, wonder time. How many we, I wonder how many we did. But anyway, this is the last one. It'll be the blue-white breakdown next week, and we've got a bunch of them for you. Dave Jones will be involved. But, Greg, let's get down to business. <laughs> Talk to James Franklin after a Wednesday night's practice. I know you had a chance to talk to safety's coach, Tim Banks. Uh, they're getting real close to that opener uh, against Indiana in Bloomington. We'll have some thoughts on that as well. But let's just start with kind of some of your thoughts uh, from James Franklin on Wednesday. He, had about, he talked to us for about 15 or 20 minutes. Surprise, Micah Parsons sighting that literally – surprise James Franklin what, what what was the deal there Greg yeah so obviously Micah um has been out in Los Angeles training for the 2021 NFL draft but he popped back into state college recently uh, also made a swing into Harrisburg to see some family and on the same day Bob that Micah Parsons showed up at the Lash building <laughs> uh James Franklin was awarding his scholarship to long snapper Chris Stoll who's a veteran will be a starter this year for the Lions and uh James said he turned around and was like, well, if Micah has second thoughts, uh, that's not going to be so good because we already gave a scholarship away. So that was a funny story. Um, obviously, Micah said, um, you know, in August that he was going to opt out. Then James said a few weeks ago that that was going to continue to be the case, even though Bateman from Minnesota, uh, the two Ohio State guys, Davis and Wade and some others have come back. Uh, Micah was never really, I don't think, seriously considering that. And so he uh, he's moving on, but yeah, that was the uh, the light moment of, uh, of Wednesday night's news conference. Yeah, one interesting note I wanted to pass along. I just wanted to get your take on it. I'm not quite sure. So Penn State is a little bit short at wideout going into the year. John Dunmore left the team. They're replacing a couple of starters. One KJ Hamler. You know, James Franklin talked to us. He was about ten days out to the opener. He said, Greg, that they still don't have an idea of who they're – they're trying to get their three best wideouts um, on the field, and they've been experimenting, moving guys inside and outside. But he made it sound like they're not quite sure who the, who the top three are, Greg. Jahan Dotson, obviously the junior, is going to be one of them. But do you really think they don't know who the other two guys are yet, or do, or do you think maybe the competition's that close and maybe some young players are involved and they're waiting to see if maybe – in the next week or so, they can kind of put it all together. No, I was waiting for James Franklin to go back to uh, his usual line of that, you know, he thinks Indiana's watching this, and so he's not going to give away any secrets. Um, that would have really made things feel normal heading into a game week. But, I mean, I think they have a pretty good idea of who they're going to work yeah. with here. You know, Tim Banks was asked to evaluate the receivers that he has seen so far. And to the surprise of nobody, because we've talked about these guys a number of times now, but yeah. he went first with Dotson. Then he mentioned Keandre Smith-Lambert. Then he mentioned Parker Washington. I mean, I mean, unless everyone's just telling us a story here, Bob, those two true freshmen are going to play. I think they're going to play a lot because we've heard more about those two guys than we have heard about um, – than we yeah. have heard about Daniel George, about Cam Sullivan Brown. So I'll be very interested to see who ends up starting, if they go with seniority or not. But um, I, even if they do, I think those two young guys are going to play early and play often. Yeah. I just want – one more thing on his, his – uh his press conference I wanted to talk about because I thought it was interesting and I think it actually is a little bit of a challenge not only for for Penn State Greg but for any team on the college level you know they have all these safety protocols in place they're doing daily testing they're keeping you know the positives down there are some outbreaks you're seeing outbreaks Greg uh, for programs in season <clears throat> and James referenced the fact that one area that they really need to be careful about is when a team travels, you know, not everyone gets to travel. And sometimes when the guys that don't get to travel find out they're not traveling, 
you know, they kind of relax a little bit or they're prone to relaxing a little bit. Maybe they're a little disappointed. They have a lot of free time on their hands. Maybe no one's looking over their shoulder. And sometimes if they're not really, really focused, you know, that's where some trouble uh, could develop with regard to positive tests. James said he had a talk with the players after practice Wednesday about it. I think that's a pretty interesting thing that he brought up. And I do believe him when he said that that's something they're a little bit worried about because it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think that that was one of the more telling comments of his news conference, Bob. And you can talk to the kids all you want and you can say that you feel like you've gotten the point across. But, man, I'll tell you what, uh, it's a really good point. And I think they're almost going to have to leave a strength coach or two behind, a quote-unquote COVID coach, and make sure those guys are coming in the workout, that they're staying where they're supposed to be staying. I mean – that's a legitimate concern, and I don't know how you police it. You know, if a couple guys on the practice squad or true freshmen who are just recently getting to campus, if they want to go out and maybe meet some people and see some friends and watch the game with other people who aren't their teammates, right. well, how are you going to stop them? You know, I guess is the question. Um, beyond having them come into the facility during the game maybe and work out during the game, you know, I don't know. But um, that is a legitimate concern, and we know James Franklin plans ahead for everything. I also think that, you know, when they get back on that Sunday, uh, they're pro- and so keep in mind they come back on Sunday, I think they're probably going to have to split up their work, or they'll come back Saturday and work out on Sunday is what I should have said. I think they're going to have mm-hmm. to split those workouts up, Bob, between guys who traveled and guys who didn't. Then Monday, yeah. so they'll have two, basically a Sunday day of testing, a Monday day of testing. So then by Tuesday, I think you'll be able to know if you're safe or not to get back together. But, yeah, it's a legitimate concern. Yeah, and I think that I think that you mentioned James Franklin being very, very, uh, you know, he's very earnest, very serious. And he's even before COVID, the pandemic, he was uh, a guy that was very much on the side of he was pro cleanliness. Greg, he didn't really like you <laughs> yeah. know chaos. He doesn't really like it. He likes he likes a neat program, a tight ship. And I think now, you know, in light of the fact that Nick Saban tested positive, uh, and I think that, you know, the, the LSU-Florida game has been suspended uh, because of positive tests on the Florida side, I think that has even ramped up Coach Franklin's intensity. Maybe that's a good thing, but it just it, – he, he is right when he says the minute you let your guard down, it seems like, with regard to protocols, it doesn't take much – uh, for for the virus to kind of get inside the program and inside the – it's not a bubble, but it's close. And uh, I think you're right about a COVID coach, too. I'm sure there's going to be some guys that are going to be watching the, the non-travel guys closely. One guy, Greg, who is definitely traveling for Penn State, assuming he's healthy uh, for the Indiana game, is senior safety Jaqu- Jaquan Brisker, who's going to be a starter this year with Lamont Wade at safety. He played a key reserve role last year. They had Garrett Taylor at safety last year. And, you know, one of the, one of the more surprising things of the offseason has been maybe kind of the buzz surrounding him. Now, he was a playmaker, Greg, in limited snaps last year. But for me, it started with he made Bruce Feldman's freaks list for some of the athletic accomplishments that he's been able to do maybe in training. And that, that tells me that Dwight Gold and James have been pleased with him and some of, the, some of the things he's been able to do. He's a big safety. He can run. He can hit. And uh, James was asked about him, and you could tell that James really likes him. He thinks the second year outside of uh, JUCO, uh, the JUCO arena is really going to help him. I think, that, I think he feels a lot better about the safeties because of Prisker's development. But what, you had a chance to talk to Tim Banks, uh, the safeties coach. What did, what did he say about uh, Brisker and what he expects for him in his second year? Not as much as you would think, believe it or not. Not because he didn't want to, but he just <laughs> – he just was – he wasn't – I teed asked, you up, man. I teed you up. Yeah, he wasn't asked a whole lot about Jaquan Brisker. It was more about everything but Jaquan Brisker, believe it or not. Um, but he obviously likes what he has seen from Brisker, and they think he's going to take a big step forward. And you, I think there's two reasons you can tell that. One, uh, because they keep saying it, and two, because – you know, they feel really good about moving Lamont Wade to that star role, that nickel corner on third down. And, the you know, Tim Banks called him the perfect guy for that job and said that he was, uh, you know, capable of handling both the, uh, you know, both the coverage aspect of it and the physicality aspect of it. I believe he used the word coverability, which I don't think I've ever heard before. But, um, 
But, yeah, so if they're going to move Wade there, they must feel pretty good that Brisker's going to be able to stay beside somebody who comes into the game and handle the work back there. So, yeah, they like him a lot, and James is right. They see the biggest jump in these Juco kids from year one to year two, and I think they expect a big one out of him. All right, we're halfway home here on the final. Penn State Blitz on Bob Flounders. He is Greg Pickle. Greg, uh, we're gonna ha- hopefully our audience is going to grow uh, as the season continues or it starts anyway, and then it continues. But what can you tell our audience about maybe rating us, reviewing us? Where can they where can they listen to us? Where can they watch us? And it's important now that we're going to be doing, I think, three of these a week in season. So there's going to be a lot of more, lot more information. I'm sure the fan base will be excited maybe to hear from Dave Jones. So what can they do to hear us and review us? Yes. Yeah, so this is still – the videos are still going to be found at YouTube.com slash All Penn State. Here's the, here's the thing, though. So you've probably been finding this via Google, Spotify, Apple. Maybe you find it right on the website when we post it. But anyway, you've been looking for the Penn State Blitz now for quite some time. You're going to start looking for blue-white breakdown. You'll be able to find that in the same places, Apple, Spotify, Google, etc. We'll put a post out on our social media accounts and on PennLive.com slash Penn State Football, letting you know exactly where to find these things. But Bob, I think we can all agree that we're excited to uh, launch this new initiative and definitely excited to be back to, uh, to game day almost. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're going to roll on here with the Penn State uh, Blitz podcast, and we're going to talk specifically now about those Indiana Hoosiers who Penn State opens against uh, on the 24th, a week from this coming Saturday. Um, I can tell you this. I know, uh, Greg, I know that – Indiana's new quarterback. He's really their old quarterback, Michael Penix, a lefty, big kid. He started the year last year for Indiana, had an injury to his clavicle sternum area after six games. He's playing very well, got replaced by Peyton Ramsey, who's now, I think, the quarterback at Northwestern. I know Indiana has a very talented quarterback in Michael Penix, but I think he's also, we've also learned in the last week, he's also a very confident kid. Had some, had some things to say about Indiana and their chances against the likes of Penn State, Ohio State, and Michigan, the big three in the Big Ten East where Indiana resides. And Greg, he's not backing away from anything. No, no, he is certainly not, Bob. He has been, uh, he has been uh, pretty clear about the fact that he thinks this Indiana Hoosiers team is uh, – going to shock the world I believe was the quote that he used and obviously I think Penn State will uh will would beating Penn State would certainly qualify as shocking the world so yeah it'll be interesting to see if that becomes sort of bulletin board material for Penn State look again I think we've talked about this before but Bob if you need bulletin board material and outside reasons to hype you up for this first game after everything that's happened to lead to this point I just don't know. I don't know what to tell anyone at that point. I think James Franklin would feel the same way. And they've mentioned that before, but you know, he's talked a lot about how they're going to have to practice without music and kind of bring their own energy because there's not going to be an atmosphere. Not that there's a great atmosphere in Bloomington to begin with, but that's here nor there. Um, But yeah, I mean, I just think that, yeah, Penix is confident and well, you know, I guess the other part of it is what else is he supposed to say that they're going to stink and that they're not going to beat anybody. I mean, it'd be nice if some teams would say that looking at you Rutgers, but um, you know, uh, it just, to me, it's, uh, they're confident. They're always a tricky team, especially when you go to Bloomington and Penn state's going to have to, um, have to be aware of that from the moment the ball goes in the air. Yeah, and, and, and you know, Indiana, I think, has played Penn State either 23 or 24 times all time. And 22 only won. and 1, Bob. 22 and 1. 22 and 1. The thing of it is, though, Greg, almost, you know, the majority of the games, if you can go, you can go back almost 20 years, the majority of the games have been very close. One score games decided in the fourth quarter. Um, Penn State's 2016 team that won the Big Ten title. They beat, I believe they beat Indiana and Bloomington 45-31, but they were trailing in that game in the second half, and there was a defensive touchdown late. That was a close game. Two years ago, they had, I think, I think they had their hands full 33-28 out there. Um, even this past year when Peyton Ramsey threw for 371 yards at Beaver Stadium uh, in a 34-27 game. I mean – the history, history tells us the game probably will be close. This is a talented offense. Indiana's, 
Indiana's offense is going to be legit. So you see these defensive problems that teams are having early in the season. Penn State starts slow against the Indiana offense. It will absolutely be a fourth quarter game. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of points in this game. That's a I don't want it's a little bit of tease for next week in their prediction. One thing I, I wanted to ask you about, Greg, is usually we learn the spreads on these games either Sunday or Monday. I have a number in mind. What do you think the line will be to open? Uh, the real line, not these like offshore lines that were out eight months ago. What do you think the line's going to be to open on Penn State, Indiana? I think you just ruined the mailbag. That's what I think. Um, well, then that, we can delay it. We can delay it. Uh, no, that's okay. We'll jump into it. I mean, yeah. again, there's no home field advantage. So you take those three points. I mean, maybe you give Indiana a point for home field advantage or two if you really want to be generous. But – the initial line, I was between 7 and 10, so I settled on 8 is what I was thinking for this Penn State-Indiana game. Um, Penn State being a favorite, of course. You know, should they be a touchdown better than Indiana? Yes. Will they be by the time everything is said and done in Bloomington? I don't know. I mean, yeah. we haven't seen so many of these guys play since the Cotton Bowl. And then some of the guys we've talked about as potential key contributors haven't played at all. So, um, yeah. I obviously think that's going to be a part of the interesting uh, evaluation factor when you look at trying to pick this game. But uh, I think eight points sounds about right. Yeah, I would say, you know, you, so, the, so you set a line, right? You're trying to get action on both sides. I think originally I would say I was going to say seven on the nose, but I think if it's seven on the nose, there'll be a lot of money on Penn State. I, so I'll say seven and a half. That half a point, maybe it'll get, I think, some people definitely interested in the Hoosiers. It might be a lot closer, and I think Indiana absolutely, if they play well and Penn State doesn't, can come up with the upset in week one. But I think it is right around a touchdown game at the open. I'll say seven and a half, you said eight. So we're pretty much on the same page there. We'll see how close we were. I think the line will probably come out Monday morning, maybe Sunday, Sunday night. Afternoon. But I, yep. I think it's just going to be an interesting game. I think it's a very interesting game for Penn State to open with. Um, but let's get to some. Uh, let's get to some. Now that I rule. Now that I ruined one of your mailbag questions, what else is left in the mailbag? Is it, is it close to empty? It is close to empty, Bob. Um, so next time we talk, we will be recapping James Franklin's first game week news conference of the 2020 season. What is the biggest question you have for him at this point, entering game week, as we sit here and talk on the Thursday before it? Well, I think not to, I don't want to confuse our audience. So I think the next time we talk, uh, that's right, Bob, we still have a season preview to do. That's right. Yes. Yeah. We, we have a season preview to do Greg. And then once we get the season preview done, which I believe will be out, I think hopefully early next week, probably Monday, I think Tuesday when we reconvene, um, we'll be talking about maybe uh, how James Franklin is, has broken down, uh, the Indiana team. And I'm sorry, what was your question for me? I was, in, I was focused on getting that piece of information out. Go ahead. No, I'm glad you did. Um, what is the biggest question you have left for James Franklin at this point heading into game yeah. week? Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty clear-cut one for me. I don't know what kind of answers we're going to get. And I hate to be a little bit negative, Greg, but I want to know who won't play against Indiana. Now, the reason I say that is – um, there were some Penn State players that were allegedly involved in some off-field issues this offseason. I think it was six, seven, eight guys. A couple of them, I think, were prominent names. Um, and James hasn't really come out, you know, with a definitive answer on their status for this game. I think when last time he was asked, Greg, there were some things that were probably still uh, that needed to happen, whether it was through the legal system or he had to have some discussions with parents or, but he's always been a guy that if, if you, you are deemed to have kind of broken a quote unquote team rule, there's going to be a punishment. So if, if these guys broke some team rules, what will the punishment be? And like I said, there's a couple of them. I don't know if it's fair to mention them by name now, but I hope, I think he's going to get asked about this on Tuesday. Hopefully he will provide uh, some information, but we're talking about some key guys. And I think to me that if, if Penn State's a little bit shorthanded at a couple spots, that's definitely going to help Indiana. 
Yeah, there's no question. I don't expect them to be, if they are, shorthanded for some rule violations. I don't expect them to be shorthanded for the full game, but the first quarter yeah. the first quarter Indiana line or the under could definitely be a little bit interesting once those come out. Um, yeah, I guess for me, because that's on my list as well, I guess the other thing I'm curious about too is just trying to get a little bit more insight about what is the red light, yellow light, green light, typical uh true freshman uh you know stoplight system look like in a year where eligibility is irrelevant because everyone gets an extra year no matter what so everyone that's a freshman now is going to be a freshman next year regardless of whether he plays (laughs) two games four games or eight games so i'll be interested to see if we can find out how they intend to use those young guys this year knowing that if a guy plays in five games, it makes no difference because he's still the same age eligibility-wise next year as he is this year. Yeah, and that'll that, – where I think that where, where I'll show up the, up the most is I think there's a chance that you'll see some wideouts play uh, on offense. But I think on special teams, I think that they won't hesitate to use a physically ready uh, true freshman uh, to play. Also, you think about a guy like Theo Johnson, the tight end. If, if he's making a lot of quick progress and they're not really – super thrilled with maybe the depth of tight end. Not that I'm not saying that they aren't may, I could be wrong, but I just, he was such a highly thought of recruit. That's now healthy. Maybe would they take a longer look at him a couple of weeks into the season? I know they have that linebacker. I think it's is it Curtis Jacobs. You wonder about if they need a sixth linebacker, would they, would they look at him? But I think all these guys, maybe not Theo, but a lot of these guys could help maybe on special teams coverage. Uh, so yeah. The fact that there is no four-game rule, which is what you're driving at for freshmen this year to be redshirted, they're not going to lose any eligibility. It's a shortened season. It was the right thing to do. I think that's a good question. One other question I have, and um, you're just going to have to wait and see as the game goes, is um, one of the things that hurt Penn State's offense last year down the stretch was they ran the quarterbacks too much. Yeah. They absolutely did. You saw it – Sean Clifford carried the ball way too many times. Even when, even when they turned to Will Levis, they ran him a bunch of times against Ohio State and against Rutgers. I, I just don't think you're going to – you're going to see a component of the quarterback run in this offense, but I, I just think it's going to be dialed back a little. I think it's going to be fewer attempts, and I think Kirk is going to emphasize to the quarterbacks that you know, it's okay to hit the ground after a four or five yard gain or get out of bounds or throw the ball away or because the, the damage that Sean took, I think, really impacted his play, obviously, down the stretch. Couldn't play against Rutgers, couldn't go in the second half of the Ohio State game. I want to see how that is managed by Kirk Scirocco. I like it, Bob. Well, I think it's time to say adios to the Penn State Blitz and remind everyone to look for blue-white breakdown starting uh, over the weekend or next week, wherever you get your audio, Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, or uh, anywhere else you find podcasts.